and welcome to 52 Miniatures. My name is Alex. This past year has been pretty good for me in the hobby, and I picked up quite a few things that, you know, I didn't know the year before. Tools, uh, uh, different techniques, things like that. And I thought I'd make a video, a bit of a summary of uh, things that have been new for me and beneficial for me uh, while doing this hobby this past year. Towards the end of the video, there's also going to be similar thoughts from my patrons. Uh, some of the things that they've picked up during the year that's been uh, uh, beneficial for them. Number one, this year I've tried to do a little bit of sculpting. Kit bashing miniatures, you know, is something I've been doing uh, quite a lot. Taking different bits and pieces from different kits, putting them together. But I've never really dared go into trying to sculpt my own things. Something I did this year, and it's been very difficult, and I've only sort of dipped my toes. My first go at trying to use green stuff or milliput to sculpt, uh, I, I just came to the realization that this is, this is really difficult. It's not something I'm used to, and I needed a different entry point just to get me started. And it was from a tip from a patron called Phil, who said, you know, use uh, soda can tins. The metal in the soda cantons, cut them up and you can use that sort of sheet of metal uh, to shape cloaks. Um, I did this uh, sort of a scale kind of an armor on a, on a shoulder pad, on a storm cast. Uh, you can use it as banners, you know, if you want a standard bearer with a banner, uh, you want banners hanging on your buildings, anything that could be cloth or sheets of metal. Um, it's really easy to cut with a pair of scissors, you can shape it, and it's just a way of getting started. You can then, if you want, actually just use that as an armature and cover it with things like green stuff and milliput. But I found it was a great place to start trying to customize miniatures with something custom made without all this stuff sticking to your fingers. After that, I've been trying to sculpt using green stuff in milliput, but it's still very difficult. But here are a few things that I picked up that has helped uh, me. One is mixing green stuff in milliput 50-50 um, to create a, a, a putty that is a bit maybe easier to work with than just green stuff or just milliput. Secondly is sometimes waiting for it to cure a little bit before starting to work with it. The initial mix can be pretty sticky and a bit too loose, but letting it cure for just a little bit and it's a little bit easier to work with, I find. By the end of it, you'll probably have lots of green stuff and milliput, uh, you know, a blob left when you're done. And you can actually make kind of your own tools, if you wish. If you have an old brush you're not using, that's really you know, out of shape, you can just take off the brushy bit and uh, put that little blob of green stuff and milliput on there and shape sort of like a tool that you can use for further sculpting, which is pretty handy. Another tip, I believe I learned this from the same patron as the soda can trick. And this is for those that like to use a dry palette. This dry palette can be used for acrylic paints, some like that, and can also be used for oil paints and similar. And as to go to your sort of second-hand store, op store, whatever you call it, thrift shop, and uh, get a second-hand frame. This frame was actually, I think, uh, Veronica bought it for the video uh, we did. We did an, a piece of art, miniature art, and it was supposed to have a frame, and she's just bought this frame, and it cost pretty much nothing, and then we didn't use it, and she just left it here. The thing is, you can just pop out whatever art is in there, and change the background, depending on what you want your paints to be on, if you want a white surface or a, a black surface or a gray surface, you can just swap out the paper underneath. You can then paint the actual frame, depending on if you want a black background or a gray background or a white background to test your paints on, because you can just paint on the frame and see what does that look like on a white background? What does that look like on a black background? When you get too much paint everywhere, you can just respray the entire frame and when the glass gets too dirty, you can just pop it out um, and, and give it a good clean. It's a pretty smart thing to use as a dry palette, and uh, you can always, you know, store it on your wall when you're not using it. This is probably going to be a bit more of an in-depth uh, discovery, probably not for most of you, but it's about uh, zinc white. 
most white paints are based on titanium, titanium white. Uh, but there is also white made from zinc. Now this first off comes from me using some white paints to dilute other paints, realizing uh, they don't all ways act the same. Now the difference here isn't huge, but I found that when using zinc white to brighten other paints, if I mix this into a regular paint, like a blue paint, I don't need tons of it to brighten things up. And comparing it to something that's been brightened with titanium white, and the difference is not huge, but it's like the paint retains more saturation. I just feel like there's a slight difference that makes me prefer brightening paints up with zinc white. I don't know where I picked this one up, but it was during the course of this year. Like the worst thing with super glue is the fact that super glue always glues itself, you know, together. Like you use super glue a few times and then all of a sudden it's very difficult to use the super glue again because there's no super glue coming out. And you start hacking at it with your hobby knife and you know, you get a little bit glue out and then you get really annoyed and you start cutting the, the actual pipette thing down and it's just a constant struggle to get the super glue out of the glue bottle. Here's the thing, if you just pop the lid on and you don't close it tight, then the glue doesn't glue itself together. It just stays perfect. So not closing it tight, but just popping it on. It doesn't dry out. I've had this standing like this for, for a month, it, you know, it's still fine and the glue still comes out and it just doesn't, you know, the, there's no hassle with getting the glue out because it, for some reason it doesn't glue itself to a full, you know, stop. It works. Recently I visited uh, Alpha Spiel, my local friendly game store, and they had organized a second-hand uh, sell your miniatures day. So essentially uh, people could come and uh, sell their used and second-hand miniatures, painted, not painted, bits, bits, boxes, unopened boxes, uh, games workshop stuff, 3D printed stuff, you know, everything that you imagine uh, you have in your basement and then just bring everyone else's basements. The store itself was also selling things, uh, you know, the open ones, open boxes, the one-off things, uh, the miniatures that, you know, games that have gone out of production, things from their stock that they just, you know, want to get rid of basically at very discounted prices. So there was plenty of uh, bargains to be found also from the store. I think for me, the most exciting thing with this entire endeavor was seeing the kids, like uh, a younger crowd, coming in with pocket money and being able to actually buy Warhammer. And if you have a local friendly game store or a you know gaming club or something like that, if they have the room, try organize something like this. It's just a great way to meet people, to be able to sell the miniatures you don't use, to be able to buy things you didn't even know you wanted, and especially for the younger crowd just to get a chance to, you know, buy tons of fun plastic miniatures for their games. Here's another one that's a little bit in depth, but I figured it would be good to know about if you haven't thought about it. It's about the finish of the paint, you know, the gloss, the, the, the satin, the matte. And this was uh, discussed by a patron as well, and I was already going to put it in the video, but it just shows that it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating. There was more of us thinking about it. So essentially, you can have a paint like a scale 75 paint that has a very matte finish or something like an AK Interactive, which is sort of not super matte, but it's not either glossy. Uh, you've also got sort of Citadel paints tend to be not glossy, but more satin. And then there's other paints, like I have some golden high flow uh, paints that are really glossy. The thing is, this doesn't only affect what the miniature looks like, it actually affects how the next layer of paint will act on top of what you've just done. So a matte paint uh, is actually a bit of a rugged surface. That's why our eyes perceive it as matte. It's because uh, light doesn't bounce off it as easy. And whereas a, a glossy paint is more of a smooth, hard surface, 
and so light sort of reflects easier, so it, it appears to be shiny. But very enlarged on like a molecular level, it's actually a rugged surface versus a smooth surface. And so you can imagine what happens if you put a wash on top of a very matte, rugged surface. That surface will, you know, stain more overall because the wash will actually go into all these little rugged crevices, not only in the very large sort of crevices where you want the wash to go. Whereas if you have more of a glossy paint, the wash will sort of smoothly flow out and just end up in and the larger crevices where you actually want the paint, the miniatures, you know, uh, chain mail and all of that. But it can also affect just how the next layer of regular paints go on there. It's actually one of the reasons I like matte paints is because it's like when I go to paint more on top of an already matte surface, it's like the paint grips better. It's like I, it, it, it's just more precise, especially for things like scratches and textures and things like that. And on the complete opposite of that, like I mentioned, the high flow, uh, very glossy paints, I've had issues where it's been such a glossy surface that I can't actually sometimes get the paint to stick to it. And then obviously there's all the steps in between. But it can be kind of a good thing to think about when you're buying paint, is that it's not just what the end result will be, the shine on your miniature, if you like, to look at a matte miniature or a shiny miniature, Choosing a matte paint or, or a shiny paint will actually affect how you paint and, uh, and how all the different layers of paint interact with each other. Plasticard. I've actually um, never used Plasticard until this year. And if you're going to get into, you know, building terrain, building dioramas, buying MDF terrain, but you just want some add some little bits and pieces of whatever here and there, some decorations and stuff like that, I can warmly recommend plastic art. It's basically thin sheets of hard plastic that are really easy to sort of cut out, uh, unless they're really thick, like this one. Uh, but yeah, my sort of material of the year uh, was uh, plastic art. This year has basically been the year where I've had a 3D printer for the first time. Um, I'm still very pleased with the 3D printer I've got, which is a uh, frozen uh, Sonic Mini 8K. Um, there has been no issues so far, and I've been pretty much printing on it for a year now. One of the cool things I think with 3D printing is actually not the access to all the miniatures, it's the access to all the bits. I see my 3D printer pretty much as a bit printing machine. The thing with bits though is that um, it's usually pretty nice to be able to edit them. And I haven't gone as far as, uh, you know, being able to sculpt or do any, you know. I've tried to open a program called Blender, which is a free program, which is great, where you can, you know, a 3D software. And it's like stepping into the Sahara without water or even, you know, the camel's gone days ago. And so, you know, I just survive for like 10 minutes and then I get heat stroke. And um, I, yeah. I've been using a program called Mesh Mixer, uh, which is really simple and I can just, you know, chop things off. If I just want to, I just, I've got a miniature and I just want to take the head off because I want to be able to do a head swap, then I can use Mesh Mixer for that. Or if I've got, a 3D house that I, you know, I just want to cut it in half because I just want half the house, then I use mesh, mix, mesh mixer. There's also another kind of handy thing, which is most uh, 3D printing uh, softwares, like the program you get for the, to be able to slice the, the STL to, you know, plug into your printer and press print. They usually have a mechanism for making holes this is usually to, to be able to drain the miniature from uh, resin so it doesn't get stuck on the inside. But you know, in our line of work, usually holes is, you know, we need usually bullet holes in quite a lot of spaces. And so I've been using that hole punching thing just to make simple holes for like, you know, oh, there's a, uh, there's a wall, it needs bullet holes, obviously. So I just use the whole thing. There's a hobbit, it needs to have a hole in his chest. So I just, you know, um, so that's been pretty handy.
We're now going to get into some of the tips from my patrons, and I'm also going to mix that with my own sort of uh, thoughts and what I use. First is a tip about brushes. More specifically, it says, scale 75 brushes. Never want another brand in my life. I am sold. That, I guess, is a pretty good review from a, a person that paints a lot, which, you know, this patron does paint a lot. I, myself, I'm going to order some and see what all the fuss is about. Currently, uh, my favorite brushes are uh, no, where is it? It's gone. My favorite brush is gone. Found it. <clears throat> These are my favorite brushes. Um, we've got a Windsor and Newton uh, Series 7, but it's not actually the miniature uh, line. So Windsor and Newton makes Series 7, and there's like normal Series 7, and there's Series 7 miniature, which isn't actually because they're made to be painting miniatures. It's just, you know, smaller brushes to paint small things. Uh, this is not miniature. Size 3. And then the two uh, red grass games, red red grass games, red grass games uh, brushes. It's a size two and a size zero point two, something like that. This is uh, this is pretty much all I use. I I then try lots of others and and uh, always come back to these. Next tip from a patron is uh, AK Interactive Paints and. Um, I've actually got some here because I had to use them for another project. So I have been trying them out a little bit. Um, I very much enjoy painting with them as well, especially if you just want a sm smooth covering layer. And uh, so yeah, uh, tr try them out. They, you know, if, if you're into the sort of Vallejo um, and the, and the uh, Games Workshop Citadel paints, then you know, uh, definitely try out AK Interactive. This is actually a pretty good starter set, uh, I'd say. It's called uh, uh, Scottish Tartans, uh, which is not a uh, starter set, but it's got a pretty good uh, range of uh, colors going in there. Here's a tip with a bit of a different value, which is uh, encourage your friends to join you in the hobby. Uh, then you'll have someone with whom you can paint and play with. Uh, this is a very good tip, um, something this patron picked up uh, this past year, and I'd have to agree. It, it kind of goes hand in hand with another uh, sort of uh, tip from a patron, which is uh, join the 52 Miniatures Patreon and Discord for the support of a wonderful painting community. I am obviously just plugging that in there, but it sort of goes a bit hand in hand with um, something that I've also learned this past year, which is... Uh, you know, the hobby can be either uh, pretty individual. You like sitting there, spending your own time with yourself, just relaxing from uh, whatever input you, you have around you. And it's just you and your miniatures and you've got your alone time. But there's also the other side of that. It's actually a pretty fun hobby to share with people, not just the gaming, but also the painting. And so involving other people around you uh, is a great thing or finding a community that you think, you know, yeah, wait, I'll try this. Just give it a try. And, uh, you know, you might make new friends or just uh, have great company while you do your hobby. Another one from a patron. I'm not sure if this counts or not, but I decluttered my desk. Having a really neat place to paint has increased my enjoyment of painting. And I don't have to worry about messing up some random model when I scoot the mess over. This is maybe not the, the, the most spectacular aha moment, but uh, it is very much an enlightening fact. Uh, I tried it myself, probably cleaned my desk for the first time in a year, and um, it kind of works. I've started doing color mock-ups and sketches for my models in Procreate on the iPad. This helps me play around with color schemes and coordinate without having to strip clean, uh, pri reprime the models if I end up not liking the idea. That's a pretty good tip. I've done that in the past as well, but actually using uh, Photoshop 
pretty efficient as well if you find the right program for you or app or whatever it is if if you have the possibility to sometimes also not see what not only see what colors you like but you can also use it as a sort of blending tool to learn a little bit about uh, color theory and stuff like that you can have you know a red background and what happens if i just add sort of a semi-transparent uh, you know blue on top of that you know and and it's not it's not only fun to actually plan out your color schemes but uh, it's an opportunity to start elaborating uh, with uh, a little bit of color theory as well if you wish along those lines is uh, another tip from a patron which is i started collecting reference uh, art images with pure ref uh, www.pureref.com it's a great software made specially for this purpose i highly recommend it if you like to use references for your painting inspiration and so that's also a great tip um, Myself, I mainly use, I have quite a few books um, that I tend to use for reference. I sometimes even go to the library and just maybe go to the art section or maybe, you know, go to the historical section or whatever and find the book that looks like it has the most pictures and uh, just start swiping. Do you still, do you swipe books? I don't know. And sometimes I just take pictures with my phone and just gather references like that. The one I'm happiest with, uh, the one I'm happiest with though, is buying a cosmetic makeup bag for storing hobby stuff. Uh, the kind with the fold out trays and fold over lid. It's basically a bag designed to hold pots, powders, brushes, sponges, etc. in a compact and easy transportable way. And the makeup market just happens to be bigger than the mini painting market and thus it's a lot cheaper. So if you're looking for uh, cheap storage, uh, cheap uh, brushes like the big makeup brushes, that's another big tip from patrons and from, from everyone else when using uh, you know, makeup brushes to do uh, dry brushing and stuff like that, like the big fluffy makeup brushes or the, even the smaller makeup brushes as well, all very good for uh, dry brushing. And, and all the acrylic racks that are supposed to be for nail varnish, but you can actually also, it appears weirdly enough, fit miniature paints in there. And, you know, all these things that usually are cheaper uh, than the dedicated miniature painting things. Here's a very specific one. Pigma Micron Pen for Eyes, which is, I guess, it's a really, really thin pen and you can sort of dot the eye in there. Um, with that comes to mind a tip, and that's that Roman Lopat has started to make videos for YouTube. Um, uh, I not remember seeing one he did for eyes. So um, I guess that's a good tip. Things that have happened this past year is, you know, Go check out Roman Lepot's uh, videos if you know you want to learn things about miniature painting. So this is a fun one. It's actually based on uh, one of the patrons wrote a, a paint shaker, which is usually you can get different types of what is called a vortex mixer, which is uh, uh, essentially a little it's a little thing and you put your paint in there and it vibrates and it, it goes round and round and because of centrifugal, I don't know what's it, uh, paint gets mixed because I mean, and I've I've been very two-minded about this because it feels like I mean, come on, can can't we just you know how how much do we need to rush our hobby that we just can't you know can we not just sit like this for like ten fifteen seconds? Is that too much? Is that you know are we are we so stressed out that we can't even just sit and shake our paints? Um, but then I've come to the realization that, you know, yeah, we, we are, um, but also some paints are really difficult to shake. Um, something that comes to mind is Chimera paints, but also other paints. And you actually really need to sit like this for like a minute or two for them to actually mix. Um, and so people buy these vortex mixes. I got a while back, I got this scent. Uh, which is from Green Stuff World. I've had issues with this. This is uh, based on the centrifugal thingy as well, only you put your paint in like this, and then you press a button. And it makes a funny noise and the paint spins. Um, 
the thing is, when I started to use this thing for the first time, is I felt my fingers go numb. You know, you get that sort of tingly sensation. Um, and that's not really something that one should be looking for uh, here in life. It puts, you know, um, and so I didn't use it. And then, you know, I, I got out some bottles of paint. I just couldn't shake them. And then I realized I could just, I could start it. And if I just not really hold on to it, I just put it in my hand, kind of like that, but protect it from falling over. And then it kind of works. If I can, can you stop please? No? Uh, okay, thank you. Then it kind of works. Um, getting a paint shaker, stirrer, vibrator thing or not, um, use your paints the way they were intended to be used and that's usually in a mixed state. It can help out putting in like an, uh, a little steel ball or whatever you've got in there. Um, but yeah, regardless of machine or not, uh, really make sure to shake your paints. Last one um, is going back to brushes a little bit. You've noticed before like how I store my brushes. Uh, this is sort of the, the long-term storage. The short-term storage, which is when the brush is sort of drying, um, I usually store them upside down. I'll show you my trick later. But this uh, was a tip from, from a patron, pretty much, which was like, you know, uh, now, the, the reason for storing your paints uh, upside down is, well, the reason for letting your brushes dry out upside down is because when you clean your brush in the water, you know, uh, there might still be quite a bit of paint residue stuck in there in, in, in the, you know, the brushes is not only what we see, it goes further up, there's a fancy name for it, it starts with an F, but I can't remember the rest of it. And so you can have a little bit of all that sort of, just a little bit of paint, just a little, little bit, and you store your brush like this, and that paint just sort of slowly, slowly, slowly starts amassing. And for every time you paint, it's just a, just a little bit, and then after a while, you, you know, you, you can't clean that part of the brush, and it changes um, how all the little lovely hairs actually are supposed to be shaped and it starts to sort of go like this instead of going into a point and all these things. But if you actually let your brush dry upside down, then uh, that's not really an issue. You can then, if you want, you know, once they're dry, you can just store them the other way around. I actually use this, uh, I've got these things. Uh, because they've got magnets on them and over where I paint there's, there's a metal surface so I can, you know, uh, actually, okay, so that was uh, not very graphical. Um, it'll hopefully prolong the life of your brushes, um, and, you know, going hand in hand with cleaning your brushes properly. If you do these two things, then the, the very expensive brushes won't really be all that expensive anymore because uh, you won't really be ruining them. So there's probably quite a few things that I might have missed out of, you know, great tips that I picked up the last year, but these were the ones that sort of were lodged in my mind, so I'm figuring it should have been the best ones. Also, thank you to my patrons for uh, submitting uh, different things. I know I've, I've not uh, put all the ideas and, and tips and tricks in there, um, but, you know, if you join the 52 Miniatures uh, Patreon and get access to the Discord, you can just read the rest for yourself. And a massive... Thank you uh, to my patrons who just, you know, you, you are in fact keeping this show running at the moment, I believe. And um, hope everyone has happy holidays and um, a happy new year. Bye. Almost forgot. Uh, best MDF terrain of the year. Uh, brutal cities, ruined uh, buildings. Uh, great gaming terrain. And you can pop several together and build L shapes or whatever. Uh, also, please check out their new designs, the uh, Ryan's new Fairlight designs, which have these plastic sheets and you can put lights inside of the houses and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, best paint range of the year, uh, golden so flat paints for me as a personal choice. Great stuff. Uh, best miniatures I've found this year pretty much. The Conquest, Conquest things, uh, the right way around.
But I don't, I don't know. I just love their miniatures. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting into the game, but that's going to be, you know, uh, maybe next year, maybe the year after that. We'll see. Uh, so far, I'm just really stoked about getting some of their miniatures. Finally, uh, the most sort of useless product. Sorry, Green Stuff World. I, I buy lots of your things and I think you do lots of great things, but the brush rinser uh, was maybe one of the least uh, of my favorites for this year. I just had to. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you.